section of the AWMA uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my research work and share some important methods and contributions uh, from my tutorial work. And thanks to everybody for joining um, and listening to my presentation. I'm excited to share um, my doctoral work with you all and some of the important contributions. Um, so the title of my presentation is, um, which is also the the uh, the title of my dissertation is on quantifying air quality and health impacts from different energy systems, including electricity generation, agriculture, and transportation. And within these um, energy sectors, I have focused on specific our uh, emission source uh, types, uh, which I will um, explain in the subsequent slides. Um, before I jump into the presentation, I want to acknowledge some of the great minds and people that I have worked along uh, my uh, doctoral uh, training. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Julian Marshall, who is my advisor, uh, all through my master's to PhD, and it was a great uh, place for me to uh, um, to uh, carry my research goals um, along with him and be part of his uh, research group, Marshall Research Group, and as well as Dr. Garvin Heath at NREL, who gave me an opportunity to utilize some of the skills that I learned at uh, doing my PhD and apply it in a national lab on the projects in collaboration with ExxonMobil Research and Engineering, and as well as uh, Dr. Chris Tessin, um, uh, who's who is the who's the brain behind the model that I've used for this work, the intervention model for air pollution, which I will explain in the in the coming slides. Um, it was his model, and um, and it was a great opportunity for me to to uh, interact with him during the course of my PhD work and and uh, learn a lot uh, from him, um, either using model or um, either discussion through various projects and as well as different funding sources from US EPAs, um, Air Climate and Energy Grant, as well as the University of Minnesota, and um, um, and the opportunities that Enrol gave me to utilize my PhD skills. So, uh, through, so I will, um, in this presentation, I will go a little bit about the background um, so that we can form the basis uh, but I will not spend too much time on the background, but spend a lot of time on the model that I've used and then some of the applications of it by giving you some of the examples from the publications that I have uh, published so far and plus uh, some of the ongoing work of which I, I, because it's under review or right now in progress, those papers, the remaining papers, so I won't be able to discuss the full results, but uh, here, but um, I aim to give you an idea about how we're using this model to um, in, in different uh, energy source sectors. So the overarching goals of uh, my research work are to quantify and evaluate metrics for greenhouse, uh, particularly carbon dioxide and uh, criteria air pollutants to estimate environmental consequences from different energy efficiency interventions. Uh, including wind, solar, um, or the demand side interventions. Um, and then um, going from emissions to impacts, um, the aim is to develop different metrics and tools to quantify air quality impacts of air emissions on human population from different uh, emission source types, uh, from point sources, from area sources, and mobile sources, and, um, and understanding their distribution of the health impacts by different demographic groups, including race, income, and geography, and demonstrating um, the use of a novel reduced complexity air quality model called InMap to answer some of the important questions that, um, uh, that we aimed in this research work. Um, so, so we have emissions from different energy systems from point sources, for example, from electricity generating units, from area sources, from um, uh, from from crops growing in different, for example, in different counties, and from mobile sources, for example, emissions from heavy duty truck or from aircraft or from a uh, barge operating from um, one uh, origin to the destination. 
Um, and if we have different pollutants, which are categorized in different categories by the EPA, um, you know, criteria pollutants, HAPs, greenhouse gas emissions, and other pollutants, including ammonia and VOCs, which are responsible for uh, the total formation of PM2.5 in the atmosphere. So um, in this work, um, I, I focused on carbon dioxide, which is one of the important greenhouse gas and gases um, uh, that impact the climate change, and then PM2.5 and the pollutants that um, that are responsible for the formation of total PM2.5 in the atmosphere, including uh, sulfur dioxide, nit nitrogen dioxide, and uh, ammonia and VOCs. Um, so I was through this, um, in this journey, I was involved in four different projects. Um, three of them I was part, are part of my dissertation and were part of my um, uh, doctoral work and the the work that I did in in the set in agriculture sector in understanding the um, uh, emissions uh, for in understanding the um, PM two point five characterization of air quality impact in LCIA. Uh, that was the work done at Enrel, so I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but I was involved in uh, four different projects, uh, and I'll talk. A um, little bit contributions from each project and how we use different methods and models um, for for work. Um, so I'll start with the 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 first project where which is a data driven uh, project where we used the continuous emissions monitoring data uh, from the US EPA for each uh, electricity generating unit uh, in the US, which is an hourly data. Um, and provides data for uh, carbon dioxide, uh, for NOx, SO2, uh, the criteria pollutants uh, at the hourly level. So um, this project, uh, this work on marginal emission factors for electricity generation in the mid-continent ISO was published in Environmental and Science and Technology uh, in 2017, um, along with uh, these ama amazing collaborators, uh, including Elizabeth Wilson, Inesh Azevedo, and uh, my advisor, Julian Marshall. Um, so the research question uh, that we focused in this work um, is to understand uh, two important metrics, which are average and average marginal emission factors for understanding the, uh, for understanding and evaluating the benefits from uh, different energy conservation interventions, including including usage of natural gas, uh, be it be solar, wind, or demand side energy efficiency interventions, or the usage of more electric uh, electric vehicles in the grid, and how they displace the existing fossil fired plants um, in in the U.S. So we want to evaluate these two metrics. Um, what are the difference? Uh, between these two metrics by uh, using a case study, um, which is MISO Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, which spans across 15 US states and serves about 42 million people, which is roughly 13% of US population. And most of the states as shown in the, the blue um, color there um, are the Midwest, uh, Midwest states and four Southern states. So this is a case study for this work where we want to uh, see how these two metrics, average emission factor and average marginal emission factor, differentiate um, for the electricity generating units within the uh, the MISO market. And um, MISO is a regional transmission organization um, under under the under FERC uh, that uh, matches the power generation instantaneously with demand to keep the electricity on in our in our houses. Um, and RTUs cover about 70% of the total uh, US electricity generation, more than 70%. Um, MISO in particular is about 16% of the US total US electricity generation and is heavily dominated by coal-fired electricity generation. So that's why we focused on this region. Uh, <clears throat> and also this work, um, the differences between these two factors have been previously um, um, estimated uh, by work from Siler Evans that looked at different NERC regions. So this study uh, looks at a, at a regional transmission organization, which was one of the recommendations from the previous work 
that uh, lead it that lead leads to this work on understanding the differences between the two the 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 two metrics average and average marginal emission factor so the as i mentioned earlier so we use a data driven approach for this work where we use the hourly emissions data for co2 so2 and nox from each and individual um, electricity generating unit operating within MISO market. So each data point in this plot shows an hourly change in generation, an hourly change in the corresponding emissions. Um, and we use the um, ordinary least square regression analysis between these two uh, variables to estimate the average marginal emission factor, which is the best fit line between uh, uh, between the change in the the in the pollutant mass uh, to the change in the generation, um, and these plots are at the this particular plot is at the at the MISO scale, so at the whole region. We do this analysis at the national scale, and then for each state um, and for each um, electricity generating unit. Uh, and show the results of how these two emission factors differ. And average emission factor is estimated as, as, as a simple metric of total uh, system-wide emissions divided by system-wide uh, total generation at, as uh, we follow the approach by uh, commonly used approach by uh, USCBA of using the average emission factor, which is a simple average of total image of simple division of total emissions divided by total generation. Um, so uh, jumping out to some of the key uh, findings. Um, <clears throat> first, we look at the differences between these two metrics at the at the MISO scale. So overall at the entire MISO and we find that on an average, average emission factors are generally higher than the marginal estimates with a typical difference of about 20 percent um, as can be seen across uh, different pollutants between CO2, SO2 and NOx. Um, so what does this suggest is that um, that the average marginal emission factors are, are roughly are are lower than the average emission factor. So if one has if one uses the average emission factor for estimating the uh, benefits uh, from uh, from say wind penetration or solar penetration uh, within within um, within within MISO, um, then one tends to overestimate the emission benefits than if someone uses average marginal emission factor. And then um, we also looked at the. Um, the the variation of uh, share of average generation and share of marginal generation with the total demand um, for which we use the proxy of total generation. So uh, as we can see, if we use the metric of share of average generation, we don't see much um, variation along the demand. I mean, it seems almost flat, but if we use the share of marginal generation, um, as the metric, we see that um, coal is a dominant marginal fuel at the low demand hours, um, and natural gas is the dominant marginal fuel at, li at high demand hours for for the MISO region. It could be different from other RTOs, say California ISO or or, or PGM. Uh, for example, California ISO is dominated by um, mostly by natural gas, so the picture could be different for California ISO. Um, but for uh, for MISO, we see the that the coal forms the uh, dominant marginal fuel at low demand hours uh, for MISO. And similarly, we see the um, similar trends for uh, average emission factor. When we see with the system divine, we see don't see much variation versus when we see the variation of average marginal emission factor versus total generation. We see that. Uh, it follows mostly the curve of average marginal generation where wind is mostly uh, on margin at the low demand hours and we see the high uh, emission factors for SO2 uh, and CO2 and NOx looks like is relatively 
um, flat across the um, uh, system demand. And then um, we also looked at the temp and how the different how average emission factor and an average marginal emission factor varies uh, temporally by uh, time of day, days of week, month and year. And we can see at some of the important um, um, contributions were the um, how the these two emission factors vary by time of day. Where if we use the average emission factor, we don't see much uh, variation. But uh, with the average marginal emission factor, we see that uh, the SO2, um, SO2, uh, NOx, and CO2 emission factors are are particularly high during the early morning and late night hours, and during the afternoon hours. Afternoon hours, uh, they are they are low than the early morning and uh, late night hours. This has very important um, implications um, on time of charging for electric vehicles, uh, especially in the MISO region where um, these results show that if the electric vehicles are charged, um, most if most people charge during the daytime, then they tend um, then th they tend to displace um, less uh, emissions per megawatt hour uh, from the coal from the fossil fire plants that are operating on margin then, charging during the early morning and late night hours when the emission factors are too high and um, they contribute more towards the um, emissions coming out of the fossil fire plants at the um, at the background of uh, of the electric vehicle charging. And then finally, we also looked at the um, differences between these two factors for at the individual uh, generate at each individual generator, and we see that there are some noteworthy differences between these two factors uh, when applied at the generator level, where we see the same um, conclusion that the uh, average marginal emission factor is lower than the average emission factor, and which could be driven by the each individual generator characteristics, including heat rate and different um, uh, emission control um, uh, equipments that are used. Uh, at each of the uh, units, uh, which could um, have affected the the difference between these two factors at the generator level. Um, so finally, I want to summarize some of the important contributions from this work. Um, is uh, we it's the first study that's that developed and compare these two factors uh, for the U.S. power market uh, for a regional transmission organization at different spatial scale at the national state utility and for each generator and um, provides metrics, uh, compares metrics that are useful to evaluate emission benefits from different energy efficiency interventions acting on the margin rather than looking at the system on the average scale and has some, as I mentioned in one of the results, has important implications for electric vehicle charging and other time flexible and potentially controllable loads in the Midwest. Um, so, so this work uh, that I just shared was a data driven uh, where we use the hourly uh, continuous emissions monitoring data to answer some of the questions of, of uh, understanding benefits from energy efficiency interventions, uh, where we used uh, the two metrics, average and average marginal emission factor. In the next step, we want to understand the whole link where we have emissions at the source and how do they impact the um, the populations um, downwind and upwind of the emission source from different uh, different source types from point area line sources and and estimate those um, impacts by race income and geography using a deterministic air quality model called a map which I'll share. So a couple of uh, I'll quickly cruise, uh, cruise through uh, uh, these background slides where so in this work we we focus on particulate fine particulate weather which is less than 2.5 micrometer um, the aerodynamic uh, diameter and PM 2.5 consists of particles and liquid droplets which forms from uh, uh, directly which is direct could be directly emitted from different um, emission sources 
uh, either from the tailpipe of the electric uh, of the um, uh, of the vehicles that combust uh, diesel or gasoline um, fossil fuels or from electricity generating units that use coal natural gas um, as the fuel from so for these combustion activities uh, lead to direct um, emissions of PM 2.5 and as well as the gaseous uh, precursor emissions of uh, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, ammonia and VACs that that react in the atmosphere through complex um, mechanisms, which are shown in this uh, diagram taken from US EPA on how they interact within the atmosphere, uh, these different precursors to form to the total uh, PM 2.5 in the atmosphere, where, for example, the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is oxidized uh, in the aqueous phase to, uh, sorry, in the in the gaseous phase to H2SO4 or uh, or hydrogen peroxide in the uh, aqueous phase to form H2SO4, and then reacts with ammonia in the air to form uh, ammonium sulfate, um, and as well as uh, the reactions of uh, nitrogen oxides uh, to form ammonium nitrate in, with the reaction with uh, the uh, ammonia in the atmosphere to form these uh, particles, which then um, deposit on the surface of the Earth and impact different populations through different mechanisms like um, uh, nucleation, coagulation, and then deposition uh, to impact uh, populations on the surface. Um, as we know, PM 2.5 uh, has um, is one of the leading cause of health impacts, um, which is responsible for millions of deaths um, around the world. And this is one estimate for year 2016, where ambient air pollution is responsible for about 4.2 million deaths and um, premature deaths in the United States, uh, in the, in, around the world, and about 100,000 um, premature deaths each year in the United States. And um, where PM 2.5 leads to increased risk of premature death and is associated with increased mortalities from uh, diseases like cardiovascular disease, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and the lung cancer, and um, has the tendency to go uh, deeply inside the lung and, um, and produce these impacts to uh, the internal organs. Um, how can we study the impacts from PM emissions? So we have emissions at the source um, so this is one of the uh, the framework that I used from the UNEP CTEC report, which forms the basis of the work that uh, um, and some of the examples that I'll be sharing um, in the subsequent slides is uh, we have emissions at the source, which forms uh, which goes in the air to have varying concentrations spatially, and and people um, our humans are exposed to that uh, that concentrations are where some of those uh, emissions are um, are intaked by the human population, which affects the uh, the the health of humans. So and each of these um, um, the process is uh, impacted with different factors. For example, the emissions emitted to air um, is, is is dependent on the st in stack height in case of the in the case coal or natural or coal fire plants um, or the tailpipe, uh, which is at the ground level um, for the transportation systems and different precursor types and then different meteorology, wind speed, mixing height and the the chemistry behind primary and secondary PM 2.5 formation. And then comes the epidemiological aspect of exposures um, and the population, varying population density spatially across space, and the existing studies that relate the um, the concentrations to the response, um, uh, the health endpoints, including mortality and morbidity to PM 2.5. Um, so it's the it's the complex um, inclusion of all these different parameters. Uh, that we want to uh, study and translate emissions to health impacts. And we use different models um, for doing that. And one of the state of the science models are the, the complex chemical transport models, which um, um, which meant some of the organizations um, 
the consulting firms and uh, and at the um, regulatory level and in academia are used um, as the state of the science models and other powerful tools that can simulate uh, these different factors that I just described in the atmosphere of the com of the complex interaction between uh, these pollutant emissions and the and the um, and the meteorology and the chemistry in the atmosphere to form the PM 2.5. Um, and these are some of the examples. Um, and these models can model many pollutants and with very high with high accuracy and can vary between the models. But some of the just but some of the um, the points that lack is these models are very complex in nature and um, uh, challenge the spatial extent and um, and the number of um, number of runs and the uh, simulations that we can do are limited by the high computational cost of these um, complex chemical transport models like CAMEX, CMAC, um, and GeoSCHEM. So um, air quality uh, scientists have developed um, a different set of models called reduced complexity air quality models, which are uh, less uh, resource intensive compared to the complex CTMs, which are time and resource intensive. Um, but they have reduced complexity loss for gra far greater number of runs, um, therefore opening door to more sensitivity analysis, Monte Carlo approaches, uh, longer simulation duration and some of the new understandings of the emission source receptor relate, uh, relationships. And over here, I've shown um, commonly used um, uh, reduced complexity quality model in the literature, um, such as a PEEP, Azure, and COBRA. And they are compared to InMap, which is used in this work and was developed uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Chris Tessin in the Marshall Research Group and um, and now um, uh, many people in different organizations are using this model um, as it um, addresses some of the limitations uh, with other reduced complexity quality model, including a PEEP, Azure and COBRA. For example, a PEEP and COBRA, the county level spatial resolution and Azure has a, um, um, operates at 36 kilometer by 36 kilometer uh, grid uh, versus in map is a neighborhood scale model, which I'll describe more in detail. Um, and can model all the PM 2.5 precursors, um, uh, secondary and PM 2.5, uh, and allows the spatial variation in secondary PM 2.5 formation and has a very really low computational cost. So if I compare with, um, with modeling all the uh, power plant emissions, um, in the US, a typical in map run would take about um, roughly from six to eight hours um, if a full in map um, is a full in map run is used compared to the complex ETMs, which can take months to run uh, different simulations. So, how do we uh, determine for this part for my work, for my uh, doctoral work, uh, we selected this in map model? Um, and how we determine the impacts of source emissions in this research is using the similar framework that I described before, taken from literature, is we use the in-map for a quality simulation and then use the dose response functions um, from uh, epidemiological studies to, um, to understand the changes in mortality rate and then uh, expose uh, to the population to understand the uh, the change in the outcomes in the premature deaths and as well as do the economic evaluation uh, for the changes changes in the the social cost from the um, from the new emission sources that um, that are built or from the existing emission source sources. So uh, in map uses the uh, I'll describe more in the subsequent slide. It's an annual average model that uses the annual emissions. Um, the inputs are annual emissions uh, in the GIS shapefile format for VOCs, NOx, um, ammonia, SO2, and primary PM 2.5. Um, in my case, for the um, for the cases that I have uh, used in my work are for individual electricity generating units, which are taken from NEI, D, 
data or the the const over producing counties which are taken from uh, DOE's um, 2016 billion ton study and for each individual freight modes which is taken from US Department of Transportation's uh, freight analysis framework data for individual uh, mode type for um, heavy duty truck, rail, barge and aircraft. And then, um, so the, these are the emissions, annual emissions input that is in the GIS shapefile, shapefile format, which are then, um, which is run in, in map to produce the annual average PM 2.5 concentrations, which are then overlaid with the census data um, for race, which is by race ethnicity. And for my work, we have used the uh, data for population at the block, block group level and for at the um, and the household income data at the tract level from the uh, American Community Survey for 2014. Um, <clears throat> and then the um, the baseline all cause mortality data at the county level from CDC is used as an input for the concentration response function that we used in this work, which I'll talk about in coming upcoming slides and um, and use the um, linear non-threshold um, dose response function from the Krisky et al with a hazard ratio of 1.078, uh, which I'll describe a little bit more in the subsequent slides. So, um, just a brief about the in-map, uh, which I uh, described just that it's, um, it's um, in-map is offers an alternative to the comprehensive air quality models for estimating the air pollution health impacts of emission reductions and other potential interventions. And in-map estimates the annual average changes in primary and secondary um, PM 2.5 concentrations um, and, um, and attributes those um, emission, the concentrations to different precursor types and provides the, um, the impacts uh, at different demographic groups. So from emissions to concentrations to health impacts is all done within this one model um, at, um, at a very high spatial resolution from one kilometer by one kilometer to um, 48 by 48 kilometer, uh, which is a function. So the, the grid used in InMap is a function of, um, uh, is a function of population density and the the, the PM 2.5 concentration. So the the way the in-map grid operates is that it's a dynamic grid where the grid changes at the, as the model runs. So the grid cells um, are smaller um, in in the uh, in the high population density areas such as the urban areas, and the grid cells are larger in the low density population areas are with low concentrations such as the rural areas. So it varies between one by one kilometer to 48 by 48 kilometer across the US. And the 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 equation um, used by inmap model is shown um, over here, which is a reaction, um, reaction, advection, and diffusion, uh, diffusion equation that incorporates all these parameters. Um, and in map estimates the pollutant concentrations by estimating a steady state solution to above equation and yielding an annual average pollutant concentration results. Um, and where each grid cell uh, varies dynamically while the simulation is running based on the gradients and uh, population density and pollutant concentration. So how does InMap work is compared to the other comprehensive models and to the measurements to the observed concentrations. So um, in, in the paper that describes InMap, they compared InMap to, to WARFCAM, uh, to COBRA uh, model, um, and as well as to the observed PM 2.5 concentrations. Um, so in when compared to WARFCAM, it tends to um, the the population weighted uh, mean fraction of bias is about minus 17 percent with R squared about uh, 0 0.9. Um, so it tends to capture the variability uh, in a similar way as WARFCAM with 
but it tends to underestimate the uh, the 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 concentrations compared to Wolfgam. Um, when we compare the in-map predictions with the total PM 2.5 observed total PM con concentrations, it tends to um, again underestimate um, the the concentrations with the main fraction bias of minus 38 percent versus Wolfgam. If we compare uh, Wolfgam with the measurements with the um, these are the monitor locations and um, the the model uh, minus measurement uh, difference in microcent per meter cube for Wolfgang, it tends to um, overestimate by uh, the mean fraction by of 14 person compared to the uh, the measurements. So this is over the workflow of in-map methodology, where, as I described, we have emissions, which is a which is annual total emissions, in a GIS shapefile format, which are used to allocate to the model grid, um, and that's done using area weighting, where emissions are allocated to each grid, the starting grid that's used, um, and then it runs dynamically. Uh, to produce concentrations, uh, annual average changes in PM2.5 concentrations caused by the input emissions, um, and the and then estimates the uh, changes in PM2.5 exposure caused by the emissions using the population data that we used, and then using the epidemiology concentration response functions um, in map calculates the health impacts of the emissions, and then we can overlay it with the economic damages. Um, uh, to convert the um, damages to the value of the statistical life metric and answer some of the important questions such as uh, environmental uh, justice, um, um, studying exposure, health and environmental justice aspects of uh, potential shifts in emissions from annual average PM2.5. Um, for this particular work uh, from a PhD, uh, we use the concentration response function with no threshold derived from the American Cancer Society reanalysis study, uh, which is a representative of the U.S. concentrations in population. Um, and I use the um, uh, the uh, the hazard ratio of 7.8%, um, which means 7.8% increase in the number of premature deaths for every 10 micrograms per meter cube increase in the concentration of PM2.5. And we've used this uh, concentration response function because it's standard and most widely used in the literature. There are other existing concentration response functions um, which are uh, nonlinear and use a, thresh, uh, use a threshold, but those are not um, yet widely used. Um, so it's, so for this study we used, which is one which is widely used and it's standard so that we can make comparisons with other studies. Uh, so this is an example of the, the in-map grid, the output grid, where we see that uh, high population areas such as LA um, have lower grid uh, cell sizes versus uh, some of the areas where the population density is low. Um, have the lower uh, resolution. This is an example of Colorado State. Um, the, for, for, this is an example for one of the outputs for the power plant uh, uh, emissions simulation. So each of the dot here represents the power plants in the um, in the state of Colorado and overlaid with the grid. And uh, this is one of the example results I showed here to show how the grid um, looks for uh, for the output from the in-map where we can see the total PM2.5 concentration from the, um, the, the coal, natural gas and diesel tap plants uh, operating um, in 2014 from the NEI data in, in Colorado and how the PM2.5 concentration varies uh, spatially across different regions. Uh, from the output of InMap. Um, then coming from applications of InMap, so this is the work. I'll, um, I'll cruise through some of the examples 
um, and how this model is used uh, with the methods that I just described. Uh, so this was published uh, just last year where we looked at the distributional effects from air pollution from electricity among different race groups, among uh, whites, Black Americans, Asians, Native Americans, different income groups, and geography uh, between different uh, RTUs. So in, my, in the first project, we looked at MISO. In this project, uh, where we looked at the distributional effects from air pollution, we looked at all the RTUs, including California ISO, ARCOT, SPP, COAL, uh, uh, MISO, um, New England ISO, uh, New York ISO, and the PJM. And look at how these impacts from PM2.5 affect uh, de different demographic groups and different household income groups. So these are some of the key findings using the methods that I just described and using in-map model and, uh, and, and aggregating the, um, the premature deaths at the grid, le grid cell level size at the, at the national scale, then for each RTO or for each state um, to, to, tell you, to tell the story that how the power plant emissions impact uh, the, um, the, the different regions geographically, spatially, and demographic groups. So at the national scale, we find that the operation of EGUs in 2014 has associated about roughly about more than 16,000 PM2.5 related premature deaths, um, which gives you an average of about four deaths per tetrawatt hour produced nationally. And 85% of those deaths are attributable, attributable to the power plants that are within these seven RTOs. So majority since RTOs form more than 70% of the electricity generation in the US. And you see the var uh, variability within each RTO of deaths per tetrawatt hour produced uh, within each RTO and, it's, and, it's, and it correlates with the, the, the coal amount of coal fired generation within each RTO. So if RTO with higher coal generation has higher uh, impacts uh, premature that's per tetrawatt. So we produce these metrics that are useful to understand um, and relate the emissions within each of these RTO to their impacts uh, on an average at the RTO level. And these are the findings at the national scale where we see um, a trend, uh, where we see the difference, there's a difference in how uh, different demographic groups are uh, exposed to power plant pollution, and we see that the Black Americans are um, on an average exposed uh, more than the um, white non-Latinos and other uh, demographic groups. Um, the y-axis show here is the premature deaths per 100,000 people. And the picture changes when we see, so these results at the national scale, if we look at each and every state, then we see a different um, picture, which is again an aggregation of uh, premature deaths within each grid cell size at the state level. So in the map here shows the risk gap between, um, the color shows the risk gap between the most and least exposed race ethnic group in each state. Um, <clears throat> for example, in Kentucky, blacks are the most exposed and has the highest risk gap between the most and least exposed race ethnic group, um, which varies uh, based on this scale, versus in Oklahoma, Native Americans are exposed uh, the highest um, uh, with a risk gap in the range of two to three deaths uh, per 100,000 people. And then if we look at the impacts by income at the national scale, uh, we see that e even after accounting for the income levels at, in the population, we see um, that we see that the uh, the differences by race ethnicity are still uh, pronounced, where we see that blacks are exposed, uh, black Americans are exposed the highest uh, compared to other race ethnic groups across all the income levels, and on an average, um, um, the population average, the uh, we see the difference between um, the exposure between high-income household groups versus 
uh, low income house groups where um, um, low income house groups are exposed a uh, little bit more than the high income groups, uh, but less uh, the differences, much less compared to the differences between exposures by race ethnicity. And then um, this was at the national scale. If we look at the each state, then uh, we see uh, again different um, results where we see that in Kentucky, the higher income group is exposed, uh, is exposed the most with the risk gap between the most and least exposed household income group of two to three in the Kentucky state. Um, so we find these regional differences uh, at the state uh, versus the national scheme. And then finally, the interstate damages, which is one of the important aspects of this paper, was to understand um, uh, how, how pollution, power plant pollution impacts from one state to the upwind and downwind states, where we see, show these uh, nice um, spatial plots uh, of for example, the plot A shows the impacts within state from pollution, power plant pollution anywhere in the US. So accounting for all the power plants in the US, how they impact each state. So for example, for Colorado, um, pollution anywhere, PM2.5 pollution anywhere from power plant accounts for about 83 premature deaths um, in, in, in Colorado and Colorado is responsible and in and, and plot and plot map B shows the uh, premature deaths in each state from the power plants within that state. And plots uh, map C shows the impacts of each state to the other states. So, for example, Colorado is the power plants in Colorado are responsible about roughly 25 premature deaths um, within the Colorado population and about 77 premature deaths outside Colorado from the power plant emissions in Colorado. And plot D shows the, the net damages. Um, so for example, Colorado is, um, it's essentially the sum of values of B plus C minus A, which provides an estimate that uh, overall, um, Colorado is responsible for 19 deaths uh, per, uh, total of 19 deaths, um, from health damages from the state as it impacts other states more than it's impacted from the pollution outside Colorado versus it varies um, quite a lot within states. For example, Texas is responsible for 325 deaths um, across the US than uh, what it is being, what it is impacted from the pollution outside the state. So these are uh, some of the other, uh, I think beautiful Pitch, uh, the maps that um, we 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 try to include, which shows for each state. For example, Colorado. How does it impact the other states downwind and upwind from the pollution within the state, and how each state, Colorado, is impacted by the pollution from the other states. For for example, over here, the the premature deaths within Colorado are uh, are 25 and and about 10 from, and from, for example, for about 20 from Utah contributes to the total uh, mortalities in Colorado from the power plant emissions. Um, so this is the summary of some of the, um, uh, the, the contributions from this work. That it's the first national scale investigation of uh, EJ aspects of PM 2.5, which had been possible because of the in-map model that we can run for many scenarios and many cases which would not, not have been possible and would have been uh, computationally um, um, uh, inefficient using the uh, the complex CTMs um, and we find that um, the 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 impacts by by race ethnicity are much um, greater than the impacts by the raised income, the differences between different demographic groups. And we see that uh, in about 36 US states, most of the health impacts are attributable to emissions. Uh, more than 50% of the health impacts within the state are attributable to emissions in other states. And then um, another example is of using InMap for the uh, 
uh, for demonstrating the impact of PM 2.5 from the corn store production in the U.S. counties. Um, so we used the uh, so this is the work that it did at NREL where we used we wanted to answer the question of how to cite the new biorefineries in the regions with available biomass production to have least impact on the ambient air quality and health outcomes. Um, so we used the billion ton study data uh, from Envil's FP model, which acts as an input to NMAP model. So these are the different counties with available cost over production. And these are some of the key findings, some of the metrics that we identified to understand the impacts of the source counties on the downwind monitors. So this has been possible with using InMap where we try to understand the difference between the um, the NAX concentration, which is 12 micrograms per meter cube, minus the um, the total PM2.5 concentration from the incremental emissions at the source counties. Uh, and this, Manager, yes. just really quickly, this is Sergio. I think we're getting to the end of the hour, so uh, maybe if we could like uh, like wrap it up so that we can have some time for questions, that, that would be good. Yes, yes, I'm coming to the end, um, just giving the example. Um, so this is the another metric that uh, is comparing the characterization factor with the baseline emissions, with the incremental emissions from different counties, um, which has been uh, possible within MAP. And then the final example in the transportation sector, um, where we use the freight transportation data to understand the impacts by different freight modes. And the motivation is the increase in usage of different freight modes for meeting the demand of different um, um, the modal usages. And I can't share the full results because it's still uh, an, uh, under um, a process. So we use these different networks uh, and data to map to uh, come up with the, the PM2.5 concentration and as well as health impacts. And these are the overall uh, conclusions from different um, um, uh, projects that I did where we used InMap as a normal spatial air quality model to understand the impacts to different demographic groups and at different uh, to answer some of the questions uh, and metrics uh, from different source types, which has been possible using this model. And these are some of the limitations that I want to point out is that we can use the concentration response functions uh, that are more recent, such as super linear concentration response function, and allow them to vary by source, geography, or chemical components. And um, and some of the efforts in the in the improvement of the chemistry of PM formation in NMAP, uh, especially including the temporal aspect of PM 2.5 formation, since it's an annual average model and doesn't include the temporal aspect, and as well as modeling impacts of ozone uh, at high resolution. And then comparing those results with the complex CTMs and other RCMs, I think is one of the efforts that needs to be done subsequent to these this work. So thank you, and I'll, I'll take the question. Sorry, I ran a little bit more over time, but um, uh, but questions are welcome. Yeah, th thank you very much, Manny. That that is a very comprehensive, I guess, uh, summary that you provided. I, I appreciate uh, you going through that. Uh, yeah, so at this point, we, we'll open it up for questions. So if anybody has any question, like uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'm not sure what uh, time people were allocating, but we, we can um, field questions for a few minutes if you guys have time. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll, I'll kick off the first question. You know, like uh, one thing that uh, was a little bit surprising to me is that you mentioned that uh, race was a more, uh, a stronger factor uh, to exposure uh, more than income, mm -hmm. um, so so that was uh, something that I wasn't expecting. Uh, could, could you expand on that, like, uh, or try to elaborate on why that might be the case? I mean, would, would be some genetic uh, predispositions, perhaps, between certain um, people? Yep, yep, yep. I think that's a really good question, and in and I get that question a lot of time. Um, but in this work, we didn't look at the we didn't look at the reasons behind why we see that difference. We try to point out that this is what we see, uh, but we have certain assumptions uh, that we can test to answer. So in, in nutshell, I don't know why we see that the, why, why the differences for black Americans are higher than 
um, white non-Latinos, but there are some assumptions and including one assumption is because of the, the, the historical legacy where uh, the power plants are situated versus uh, the people of different demographic groups are living um, and their households are, uh, are presently. And one another important thing that we probably is part of the subsequent work and we didn't look at is that how much is the pollution from outside state impacting to the differences that we see here? Because it could be that uh, for a certain state, most pollution is coming from outside the state that leads to the, uh, the disparity that we see between different demographic groups and household um, income groups. So these are some of the assumptions that the pollution, um, how much is the contribution from pollution outside different state that is impacting the um, the the population different population groups within different state and and where people of different demographic groups are located um, versus others versus rural versus other for example um, white non Latino pop populations tend to live more in the rural areas um, so that's that's why probably we see that those are impacted more than the Asians and other uh, Native Americans and white uh, Latino groups. So, but we haven't tested it, but these are some of the assumptions. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that in, in the concentration, um, the, the concentration response function that we use to estimate this, we use the um, similar baseline uh, mortality rates for all cause between different demographic groups. So we use the same mortality rates, all cause mortality rates between black, white, not Latino, because there's not much data on that. So, so the, the baseline mortality is same between different demographic groups. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else has any questions? Well, I'll ask one more, I guess. It's, yeah. Uh, the, the, my, the other question I had is, um, has this in-map model been used for any kind of practical applications, like by any regulatory agency or any type of group to try to identify either areas of concern or like a certain population that might be more um, impacted by a specific type of um, emission, like a, an AGU or something like that? Yep. Yeah. Um... I mean, as, so far, I mean, as, as I shared, I, I was hi hired at Enril as a graduate intern to, for the applications of InMap. So that's one place I know has been utilizing the InMap capability to answer some of the questions related to uh, PM 2.5 impacts from new emission sources. And the project I was involved with ExxonMobil Research and Engineering, they were interested in knowing the impacts of new um, biorefineries uh, that they, they aim to build in the future and the required cons to production to meet that demand in the future. How does it impact? So we definitely see that interest from industry and from national labs in this model. Um, and, and it has been um, uh, used to uh, answer some of the important uh, questions related to uh, impacts from you know, electric vehicles um, and other energy efficiency interventions um, has been published in very um, uh, highly uh, important scientific journals. Um, but I, I am not aware if it has been used at the regulatory level yet. Okay. There have been efforts before, but uh, I'm not sure where those efforts are with the group right present, but it's definitely used. Um, there has been a lot, lot of interest at, at and well, and it's used right now there um, in other uh, uh, and at the academic level. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Like, we, uh, if you want, you could also type your question through the uh, chat box. You know, there's like the conversation tab um, on your screen. Okay. Well, yep. um, and I'm happy to take any questions over email or. Uh, if there are any curiosities and questions about in-map model, uh, I think I shared um, on the uh, on the website as well the link. But 
I'd be happy to share that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess if you have any questions to Maninda, uh, and uh, later on you can send them to me also, and I can make sure that he gets them. But uh, well, uh, seeing that there are no more questions, I, I want to thank Maninda for your time and for uh, presenting this very interesting project. And uh, and again, th thank you very much to everyone for participating also. And uh, if you have any feedback or any uh, any anything you want to share with uh, AWMA, please let us know. Uh, we this new new format, you know, so we want to make sure that it works for everyone. And then um, also, if you uh, want to volunteer to present uh, uh, some topic, I mean, we're always looking for presenters. And I think that our next pre uh, monthly meeting is going to be through the same system. And I believe that it's going to be. Uh, let's see what it was. It's going to be on May 12th. Um, that's Patrick Cummings. I'm not sure if. Um, if Miriam is, is still on the line, if you want to uh, give a little words about that coming up uh, presentation. All right, maybe she's not in there anymore. But but yeah, we, we'll go ahead and send a, um, an email and, and let you guys know that uh, about the next presentation we have. But again, thank you very much, Maninda. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And feel free to send us any feedback, any comments, or any questions. We, we really appreciate your time. And stay healthy, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Take care.